Okay, Barry, I think I finally figured this one out. I think I finally cracked the nugget here, okay? It took me an entire day of extensive research, but I have discovered that Devil Fruit Effects video I made a few days ago. I may have mixed up the definitions of active abilities and passive abilities while doing that video. If only anybody out there, a single soul on this planet, would have commented that I messed this up, that whole process would have gone a lot smoother. But hey, what are you gonna do? Not a single person said anything. <laughs> okay, so thanks to all of the people that brought that up. No, seriously, that win went whew, right over my head. Um, you know, because I was thinking, I'm gonna do a video about devil fruit effects. And so I took out my little notepad here, and I sat down, and I was like, okay, well, I'm gonna divide them up into different categories. And I'm like, okay, well, active abilities are always gonna be active, and then passive abilities are not always gonna be active. Easy, right? And usually whenever I make a mistake like that, I'll catch it, like, when I'm in the middle of the video. There was a moment in the video where I, I think I, I actually had to say, like, passive abilities have to be activated. You think that would have cued me up? But I'm like, whatever. Um, but the whole process of filming and then editing, it, it didn't even occur to me until I uploaded it and people were like, Hey, Teching, I think you mixed up those definitions. I'm like, yeah, well, I guess hindsight's 2020. What are you going to do? But that whole process has left me rather confused, so today... I decided to do a video on the most confusing moments in all of One Piece. So I typed into Google, the most confusing moments in all of One Piece. And after sifting through about a million articles on whether or not Kaido was a dragon or a duck, sorry, I might have been actually the one that started all that nonsense, um, I discovered a CBR.com article. Now, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with CBR. I believe that the acronym stands for comicbookresources.com. Um, I know Xforts um, does a whole series on his channel based on on JoJo-based CBR articles, um, but they do a lot of, like, top 10 lists and ranks, you know, for comic books, manga, anime, all that kind of stuff, and, um, I'm not over there very often, but every now and then I'll find myself reading, like, a top 10 list or whatever, but typically, you know, I don't take them very seriously. If there's a list they have of, like, here are the top 10 definitive strongest characters in Bleach. I'm not gonna, like, you know, take it to heart, you know, whatever. So, um, this is not a slight against whoever wrote the article. It's just, hey, these are the top 10 most confusing straw hat moments in One Piece, and I think of myself as somewhat of a One Piece expert, so if there's people out there that are confused by One Piece, I feel like, okay, well, I'll try to explain it for you. And, you know, Oda's not perfect. Sometimes he does, you know, miss things or let things fall by the wayside. So, let's dive into this article and see what we got. Number 10. Why don't the Straw Hats talk about their personal lives? And in the article, it specifically mentions, you know, how come Zoro never talks about his parents? You know, we know nothing about Zoro's parents. You know, we know he was raised in Shimosuke Village, but we know nothing. So how come Zoro never talks about his mom or his dad, or anybody ever asks Zoro about his mom or his dad? Um, something more specific about the story is um, how come Sanji never brought up the fact that he was a prince of the Germa Kingdom, you know? Uh, at, ne at no point in the story, while the Straw Hats were traveling, Sanji never mentioned, oh, hey, guys, by the way, I know you met me at the Baratier in the East, but I'm actually from the North Blue. He did mention he was from the North, but he never expanded upon that anymore. He's like, I was actually raised in the North by the Germa Kingdom, you know, that, you know, uh, evil organization of, like, supervillains that literally came out of a comic book, or the comic book is based on us. Anyway, yeah, it's a crazy story. I'm not going to bore you, but my dad was all into, like, genetic modification with my brothers and my sister, and that ended up, you know, my mother ended up dying because of that, and then he threw me in a dungeon and locked me up with an iron helmet, and I eventually got away. Anyway, crazy story. Here's some parfait, everybody. So let's tackle that first, the whole Sanji not explaining to the Straw Hats that he's the prince of the Germa Kingdom. I don't think that's confusing. I think that makes a lot of sense. That was a very traumatic part of Sanji's life, and, you know, it was so long ago at this point, because I, when the Straw Hats meet Sanji, he's 19 years old, he's working at the Baratier. I think he defected from the Germa Kingdom when he was, like, nine or something like that, and then he worked on the orbit for a few years, and then that's when he met Zeph, and they were stranded on the rock, and then, but for most of his life since then, he was working at the Baratier, and he really enjoyed working at the Baratier, being able to cook and everything like that, right? So he probably, at age 19, he probably viewed that as, like, a distant memory, doesn't want to talk about it. He viewed Zeph as his father, not Judge. He didn't care about his brothers. I guess he had a little bit of a connection to Reiju, because Reiju helped him get away. Um, so maybe he thought about, you know, I hope Reiju's doing okay 
every now and then. Uh, but for the most part, that was a horrible part of his past. Other than, like, his mom and, like, Reiju, he probably didn't even think about it very much. And so when he finally ended up joining the Straw Hats, he probably thought, like, you know, it it's not important. You know, like, you know, they don't need to know that I'm the prince of the Germa Kingdom. They don't need to know I'm even connected to the Germa Kingdom. Why do they need to know? That's not relevant in anything. I've, I've moved beyond that. That's part of my past, and they didn't want me anyway. So screw it. Forget about it, you know? And remember the last things that Judge said to Sanji when Sanji was escaping the Germa Kingdom. Judge let him go. He was just, like, he was stealing the keys to his, like, helmet, ready to get out, and Sanji was about ready to fight his dad. And Judge is like, oh, you want to leave? Yeah, fine. Get the hell out of here. I don't care. Just make sure of one thing, Sanji. You never mention that you are connected to us. You never mention that you're part of the Germa or you're a Vinsmoke. Just get the hell out of here and never come back. And that'll be, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I, I don't think um, Sanji took that like, oh, my dad told me not to mention it, so I therefore won't mention it. But it's kind of like the feelings mutual kind of situation. Like, yeah, okay, you don't want me to mention I'm from the Germa? Screw you, dad. I don't even want to be part of the Germa. I'm out of here, right? And so, yeah, and so working with Zeph at the Baratier for so many years, he's just like, that's a distant memory. That's never going to come up again. I don't even care about it. That's not, that he probably like blocked it out of his memory as much as he could. And then when he traveled with the Straw Hats, uh, until it actually came up when Beiji showed up and like, hey, Big Mom wants you to come to the tea party and we know you're connected to the Vinsmokes. That was like the jaw dropper moment for Sanji when he was like, oh shit, you know, like now I have to deal with this. I finally, it, it's come back. The past has come back. I have to deal with my father and my brothers and everything again. And uh, he doesn't really explain it to the Straw Hats all too well. But yeah, but I think um, also the whole thing with Zoro's family. I mean, maybe Zoro never knew his parents, you know? Um, I have said before, I would like more moments on the Sunny with the Straw Hats just hanging out and talking to each other. I can kind of understand why Oda doesn't do that to keep the kind of pace of the story going. Uh, maybe that might slow it down a bit. I mean, I personally would like that. But maybe, you know, taking, like, a few chapters in between arcs where the Straw Hats aren't really doing much of anything, just hanging out and talking might not be r really good for, like, the sales of, like, Shonen Jump or something, you know, because there's, like, a, a marketing aspect of this or whatever, and everyone's like, you know, Oda, you gotta get to this point in the story, gotta get to this point in the story, and all that kind of nonsense. But I would prefer that. That would be nice. Um, I think at the end of the day, though, what really matters uh, about the Straw Hats is not necessarily they're going to, you know, explain everything that's happened to them, but if they do want to talk about it like if there was ever a moment if there was ever a moment uh pre-time skip where Sanji was like up late one night and he just couldn't sleep and he was racked with all of the horrible memories of his past you know and in the Germa kingdom you know the way his brothers and his father treated him and the death of his mother and all that kind of stuff if he wanted somebody to talk to about that the Straw Hats are family he'd have been like hey you know, uh, you, you know, Usopp, you know, do you have a minute? I kind of just can't sleep. I want to talk about stuff, you know? And Usopp's like, okay, sure, what's up, Sanji? And he tells him about, he's like, yeah, you know, that's the situation with me. And he's like, man, that's really messed up. He's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, but it's okay, because you're the person you are now and everything like that. That's that's what it comes down to. Also, it, I mean, it also wouldn't make any sense if, like, let's say, you know, when Jinbei joined, you know, all of the Straw Hats immediately just, you know, like, give massive exposition to Jinbei. You know, like, Zoro's like, hey, Jinbei, Welcome to the crew. I'm Zoro. My childhood friend Kuina died when I was a little kid, and so now I become the greatest swordsman in the world in her memory. And then Nami walks up, like, Jinbei, it's so great to have you on. So uh, my stepmother, my foster mother, Belmir, uh, got shot right in front of me by Arlong, and so, oh, oh well, well, actually, you already know that. Well, I'm just telling you about my past and everything like that. And then freaking Robin comes up, and she's like, my mother was killed in front of me as well. You know, it's like, you know, if they want to talk about this stuff, and if the Straw Hats ask, um, um, you know, you know, if like when Brooke joined, if Brooke joined and then maybe asked a question about Nami's parents or whatever, um, you know, maybe she would have told him or maybe she would have been like, yeah, well, I, I had, I don't know my biological parents, but I know Bellamere was my mom. Maybe she would have left out the part where she got shot, you know, because it's like, it's the same thing with any situation with like a family or friends, you know, you're not going to always explain everything that's going on. You know, if you ask, it might be like, ah, that's kind of like a touchy subject, but you know, you are my friend or you're part of my family I'll tell you if you want but you know I really don't like to talk about it too much you know so that's the situation I look at there I don't view that as confusing at all I view it as just like pretty normal with a group of people together and also keep in mind yes the Straw Hats are very much Nakama and they are family but I think if you add up all of the time that they've actually been together um, excluding the two-year time skip when they weren't together um, they were only like together for like a year you know or something like that less than a year pre time skip and like a few months maybe 
maybe six months or so since the post time skip. So it hasn't been a lot of time that they've really been traveling together, right? So anyway, that's my view on that. Uh, number nine, what do they do when they are not busy fighting death? The Straw Hats, of course. And so this is a question, like, what do they do on the ship? You know, we know Zoro trains. We know Usopp's always fidgeting with his gadgets and Frankie's making new stuff. But what else do they do? Um, so this is actually a lot of stuff that is explained in the SBSs, uh, in the Shitsumon Oboshu Suru, like the question corner that Oda does. Um, you can go and find a complete list of that on the wiki, but Oda goes into detail of, like, what their sleeping schedule is, what their bathing schedule is is, um, you know, what are their favorite fruit foods, what are their least favorite foods, and also, uh, he, he explained, like, if the Straw Hats lived in our world, what kind of jobs they would have, and that also gives you a little bit of look into, like, you know, what their personal hobbies are, and the things that they're interested in everything, and, and such of that nature, um, you know, like, for example, I think it said, for some reason, it doesn't, it didn't put Sanji as a chef, it put him as, like, uh, like a hair salon, like a stylist sort of thing, so maybe Sanji's into, like, styling his hair and stuff like that. You could see the Straw Hats hanging out and eating foods or whatever. Like, let's say they were eating marshmallows and marshmallows are Frankie's least favorite food um, because they're not hard enough. That was that was the definition that Oda gave. He's like, Frankie's like, hey guys, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, we're roasting marshmallows. He's like, ah, um, I don't like marshmallows. They're not super enough for me. I'm gonna go have a burger, you know? And so we know what their favorite foods and least favorite foods and kind of like an idea of what their hobbies are. You know, Robin likes to read about history and whatnot, you know. Um, uh, Usopp's really into gardening because of his pop greens. Nami's also into gardening because of her Meekin trees and drawing maps, and maybe maybe she draws, like, little doodles and stuff in her notebook on her days off or whatever. I don't know, but it's like, yeah, if you look at the SBS stuff and, like, behind the scenes, Oda does give a little bit more detail of what they do, because I think Oda himself is maybe a little aware that um, he doesn't really show the, the, the Straw Hats in their off time very often. It's usually just in the action of a story arc when we get to see the Straw Hats. So I think Oda kind of tries to make up for that with SBSs and data book entries and like what the Straw Hats are really about gives them more character, you know, without actually showing it in the story itself. So yeah, that's the explanation there. Number eight, why are they so rushed? Okay, so this one is, uh, it mentions, like, how come the Straw Hats are so much in a hurry um, to finish the journey, to get to Laugh Tale, to find the One Piece? And it specifically mentions after the time skip, like, like they start back up again, and they, like, they act like they're invincible. Like, let's just charge into the new world, and we're gonna fight against Yonko now. All right, so a few things here. When it comes to Luffy specifically, you gotta look at Luffy's backstory here, okay? Luffy was inspired by Shanks when he was seven years old. Luffy wanted Shanks to take him on his crew and start becoming a pirate, but Shanks wouldn't let him. Instead, he gave him the hat. He's like, hey, you gotta train, but eventually when you grow up, yeah, you can go out there and be a great pirate, and once you've done so, you can give me back my hat, okay? So for ten years, Luffy was training alongside Ace and Sabo, and then they thought Sabo died. So they were fueled by not only their individual dreams, Luffy wanting to be king of the pirates, and then Ace wanting to be his own pirate, you know, even greater than his father, or separate from his father, Goldie Roger, they were also fueled on by the death of Sabo, the supposed death of Sabo, and so they're like, yeah, we're gonna train for 10 years, and then we're gonna hit the ground running, we're gonna leave Fusha, this little backwater village, and then we're gonna take the world by storm, Luffy, and so 10 years go by, um, you know, well, Ace leaves before Luffy, and then Luffy's even more motivated, like, okay, Sabo's gone, Ace left, it's just me, and I'm gonna train for the next three years and so it's no big surprise after the three years is over and after he's he's 17 now and you know after all the training he's done and everything like that he's trained with his gamu gamu no mi he's like he punches out the lord of the coast i'm gonna do this i'm gonna get going you know i'm not gonna like take my time and also luffy's not the kind of guy that does that he's usually not the kind of person that's like okay well i'm gonna plan everything out and make sure maybe take a few years traveling around the east figuring out where all the you know places are in the east gathering up a decently sized crew and then maybe after a few years i'll go into the grand line no, Luffy's like, screw this, I'm gonna get a crew, we're gonna go to the Grand Line, we're gonna find the freaking One Piece, and now I'm gonna be a great pirate, let's do it. I've already waited waited 10 years, I'm gonna do this now, right? And so, a lot of the other Straw Hats are very similar. Zoro was training his entire life to be the greatest swordsman, he saw that as an opportunity. You know, Sanji was at the Bradier for so many years, they were, they were training, and they were improving in their own separate ways. Usopp was in his home village for so long, so he's like, okay, this is finally the opportunity for me to leave my sleepy little village and go out there in the world, like my my father and become a great pirate, okay? So that's why they're so motivated to do that. Um, as it is after the time skip, um, they've basically had to wait for two years, and that entire two years they were separated, and they knew about all the stuff Luffy was going through. 
he lost his brother at Marine Ford, you know, and everything like that. So I can understand 100% where after the two years are over, they want to get right back to it. They want to get back to Luffy. They want to get back to their captain. They want to be a crew again, and they want to continue their adventures because they had so many crazy adventures pre-time skip. Now they had to wait around for two years to train and get stronger. And it's like, once again, they want to hit the ground running. They're like, we're going to go into the new world. We spent two years training. I don't think they think they're invincible or anything, but, you know, after two years of Zoro training with Mihawk, he's like, I want to test my steel in the new world. I want to see what I really stack up against. And then when it comes to the Yonko, like, you know, the whole thing with Sanji going up against, you know, the Germa and then Big Mom and Totland and everything, that was, you know, Big Mom getting involved with the Straw Hats directly. You know, Luffy did issue the challenge to her at Fishman Island, but that's what Luffy does. You know, he doesn't really think about things. He just, like, kind of goes right ahead and, like, issues challenges to Yonko. Um, I don't think Luffy sat down and thought, like, should I be, should I be challenging and threatening a Yonko? Is that a smart thing to do right now? He doesn't think about that. He's just like, hey, you know, uh, I'm in charge of Fishman Island now, and then you know, Big Mom got involved with the Germa and then Sanji, and then that's how they had to go to Totland. And then Law was the one that, like, hey, Straw Hats, you want to form an alliance to take down Kaido? And that's kind of where all that started. Um, you know, it wasn't really a situation where all of the Straw Hats collectively decided, you know, all right, we trained for two years, we can take down Kaido and Big Mom. It, it wasn't like that. It was just, you know, happen chance over the course of several story arcs that led them to that conclusion. With that being said, though, Kaido and Big Mom are probably going to be defeated in this arc so that's how that goes there um number seven does luffy not care for his parents okay so this brings up the fact luffy never mentions his biological parents um and what from what we found out he doesn't even know what dragon looked like up until recently when he looked at the newspaper so how come this is never brought up how come this is never addressed um and apparently that's confusing I don't find this confusing at all. Um, I've known people in my life that don't know their biological parents, you know, that they were raised by you know, their aunts, their uncles, grandparents, foster parents, or whatever. And some of them are genuinely curious about who their biological parents were. They want to know if they're still around or where they're at or why did they, you know, like leave me and how come, you know, all that stuff happened. And that makes sense to me. And then there's other people I know that have no interest whatsoever in their biological parents that like, hey, they abandoned me, they left me, they didn't raise me. Uh, the ones who did raise me, like my foster family or my grandparents or whatever, those are the people that I actually care about. Those are my parents as far as I'm concerned. Um, I don't care where they're at in the world. My biological parents, I don't care what they're doing or if they're still together. You know, that's they're not part of my life, so I don't care. They were never part of my life, so I don't care. And both of those uh, sides of that coin, I, I think, makes perfect sense. You know, it just comes down to an individual thing. Luffy just doesn't care about his mother or his father very much. Not to the point where he's like, you know, I wonder who my dad is. Oh, it's Dragon? I gotta go find my dad, you know? He's just, it's not, it's not going from Hunter Hunter. He, he really just doesn't care, you know, it's whatever. Um, if, if one of the Straw Hats asked Luffy, like, if Nami went up to him and was like, hey, Luffy, did you have a mom growing up or, you know, a motherly figure or somebody like that? Maybe Luffy would say Dadan or possibly Makino, you know, like, oh, well, there was this mountain bandit that kind of raised us. But for the most part, Luffy kind of lived out in the woods with Sabo and Ace, you know what I mean? Um, but yeah, I don't find it confusing. I don't think it's something wrong with Luffy or something like that. It's just he's kind of like a very energetic, happy-go-lucky character that's super invested in his friends and in his um, in his adventure. And also, maybe that's the reason. Maybe because he didn't know his, his biological parents growing up, um, he just decided to put a lot more uh, emphasis on the friends that he had, treating them like family. Also, to be on a kind of a sad note, um, the One Piece world, the way we know it's set up with the world government and everything and how corrupted it is, orphans are probably a lot more prevalent in this world than in ours. You know, it's probably a lot worse with, like, parents abandoning their children. Same thing with Frankie. Frankie's parents were pirates that just abandoned him at Water 7 and then Tom picked him up. You know, it's just, that's how it goes. Um, number six, how can Nami beat the life out of Luffy that easily? So the author does mention here, like, this could just be seen as a gag or for fun, but they also view it as, like, Oda specifically mentioned in an SBS one time or in, like, a data book one time that uh, Nami is, like, harming Luffy's spirit, you know? And so they took that to mean, like, oh, spirit must mean hockey. So that means Nami does have hockey, and it's stronger than Luffy's hockey, and that's how she's able to, like, beat him up so bad when he says something stupid, or he, he like, recommends to go to an island or something that they don't want to go to that's super dangerous, and then Nami, like, smacks him upside the head, and he gets, like, a black eye and bruises all over the place. Um, I, I understand the logic you're going with there, with, like, spirit meaning hockey, 
but no, it, it really is just a gag. And you know, it does it does sometimes break the flow of the story, and sometimes it works better than others. Um, another perfect example of this, where he kind of breaks it and kind of flows along with just like, eh, just go with it, guys. Uh, was during Whole Cake Island when Luffy got a tooth knocked out by um, Sanji, and the entire arc, you know, he doesn't have a tooth. And I'm thinking, like, how's he going to get another tooth? Is Chopper gonna like make him a fake tooth? And I guess Oda, if he, if Oda wanted to be serious and if he wanted to like treat it like realistically, yeah, he would have just had Chopper make him a fake tooth and put it in, and then whatever, you know, we would just forgotten about it. Um, but no, they go to Beiji's place and drink milk, and Luffy just magically regrows a tooth. That's Oda at that point basically just being like, guys, it's a manga, don't take it too seriously. I mean, come on now. You know, it's like the Straw Hats are weird, they have weird biology, just just roll with it. Okay, there you go. I wanted him to re regrow the tooth. I could have done it a realistic way, but I chose to do it a funny way, because it's kind of like also a comedy in terms of the manga. It's not all a comedy, but it does comedy elements, so it's like, just go with it. It's the same thing with this. Uh, don't think of it like Nami has some form of like super powerful hockey, and she can like, you know, only awaken it whenever she's mad at Luffy or something like that. That would be interesting, I'll give it to you. That would be kind Kind of fascinating um but no it's it's just for comedic effect and i'll be honest like i said even with me that does detract from the story sometimes that does bother me sometimes that it's like inconsistent like with the milk thing but it's like because you could say like oh, all right so essentially brooke is invincible if he just basically just you know drinks a bunch of milk or if he just dives into a pile of milk he'll be good he'll heal any wound immediately it doesn't matter what it is and i don't think oda would go with that i think oda would just be like it's it's just a joke guys just just, just move along, you know? Um, you know, okay, so that's how that's how that goes there. I don't know if that's that eases the confusion at all, but that's what it is. Uh, another one that's sort of like this, but maybe not, is number five. Zoro's sense of direction is ridiculously off, and he mentions that it's like it's not even just a running gag. It, it, it's such a part of Zoro's character. Um, I think it can be both. It can be a running gag and a part of your character as well. Um, this actually leads into a very interesting theory that I've seen before and I love. It's that Zoro did not have a bad sense of direction during the East Blue. Like, his sense of direction wasn't like a running gag at that point. Um, instead, it was after they got into the Grand Line when his sense of direction started getting really bad and people kind of focused on the fact that he now has the Sandai Kotetsu, the cursed Kotetsu blade and people think, the theory goes, the Kotetsu's curse is whoever wields it has a horrible sense of direction because that's the funny thing, whenever Zoro gets lost he doesn't think he gets lost. He thinks he's right on track. He thinks everybody else got lost. So I don't think this is something he's been dealing with his entire life. I think it's something that's recent that Zoro usually had a pretty good sense of direction, but then he got the Katetsu, and now he always gets lost everywhere, and he's like, man, what are those guys doing? They ran off that way when they should have won this way. You know, now I'm, only, I'm the only one here. So yeah, with this one... I think Oda might actually go a different angle with it than just treating it like a joke. Um, it is a joke. It is a running gag. But I think Oda's actually going to take it somewhere. He's going to be like, actually, this is the reason Zoro's had a horrible sense of direction. You know, that would be pretty funny, right? Number four, how does Luffy's gear fourth work exactly? Okay, th this is one that I actually think I can explain the most, okay? Um, Luffy's gear fourth incorporates all the experiences and insights he had underwent during his lifetime. That's a weird way to kind of describe it, but I guess it's accurate. It's the technique that he developed after discovering hockey, the main ingredient, and even though Luffy briefly explains it, fans are still unaware of how the technique operates. More specifically, how does he achieve his soft yet hard phenomenon? Huh. Uh, even more importantly, how does he bend armament hockey, the very representation of solid, into a rubbery and soft state? Okay, so uh, first of all, this is once again anime logic. I made a whole series of videos talking about how they could work, or even if it's possible or even feasible from like a science fiction standpoint if they could function in our world and uh pretty much i think gear second was the closest we got but the other ones not so much my favorite is gear third i would have actually put gear third on this list because the premise of gear third is luffy blows air into his bones and then moves it around his body to make giant limbs to attack his enemies but it doesn't make any sense that because the bones are not connected. Your bones are not hollow that can like, you know, switch air in between them. Your bones are like separated by like muscles and ligaments and stuff, right? That would be like I blow into my thumb bone and it ends up in my legs somehow. That just doesn't make any sense whatsoever. 
but it's anime logic, right? And so in the case with Gear 4, if you want the logic behind it, Luffy blows air into his muscles, his muscles get bigger, which make him stronger. There you go. Now, as for the hard and soft kind of phenomenon that is mentioned here, uh, Luffy's uh, Gamu Gamu no Mi is his devil fruit, is his rubber rubber no Mi, and then using hockey does not nullify his devil fruit powers. Using hockey, you can, like, attack Logias and stuff, but when it comes to his own body, he still very well has the properties of rubber, but also the hardening, the vulcanization of his hockey. Okay, so it's like these two things together. It's a technique that only Luffy could pull off with his devil fruit. Um, but I think it makes perfect sense to me. And I think there's even substances like that that exist in our world that can be rubbery, but also very durable. All right. And that's the situation. So he has like a rubber ball body surrounded by this layer of vulcanization of like coating. And so, you know, whenever something hits him, it doesn't crack because there's still some elasticity from the rubber underneath it. I, I, I to me, it makes perfect sense. Um, and and when it comes to like moving it around the battlefield, I think that's just him using his hockey to change the direction, you know, uh, forcing his hockey, his fist like one way or another way for his Culverian and his uh, other techniques that he utilizes while in gear fourth. Um, yeah, so this one, I think for the most part, pretty much if you take anime logic into factor here rather than like real world like biology, I think it makes perfect sense within the realms of, of One Piece. You know, it's just he's made of rubber and he can add like hardening on top of that. And so hard and soft. There you go. Um, then we have number three. Sanji's chivalry doesn't make sense. Okay, so this addresses uh, Sanji's, like, code of honor, so to speak. His code that he can, like, never strike a woman no matter what. Uh, even if that woman is attacking him or his friends, he just can't bring himself to do it. And the example they give in the article is, like, you know, Zoro has a code of honor as well, uh, but still, like, if his friends were in danger, he would slice people down if, if it's uh, necessary. Well, I don't even know about that, honestly, because there was a scene during Wano when I think Kiku got kidnapped at the beginning of the arc, or maybe it was Osuru. Uh, somebody got kidnapped, and then Luffy's like, hey, Zoro, stop them! They're kidnapping! And so Zoro's just like, because they were kidnapped by sumo wrestlers, and they were, like, naked with, like, the cloth, and they didn't have any weapons on them, and so Zoro just lets them pass. And Luffy's like, why didn't you stop them? And Zoro's like, I don't know, Luffy. Cutting up a bunch of naked dudes, that's kind of, that's kind of against my code as a sword. Man, that's not that's not cool you don't do that and then when it comes to Sanji's chivalry though it's a little bit different uh, it was explained Sanji um it's not like he just doesn't like oh that's just I just choose not to but in case of like extreme danger I'll do it uh, I'll fight a woman it's the situation that he was actually this was beat into him by Zeph at a young age like this code of chivalry was like seriously beat into him so it's sort of like a um a mental thing. It's like a block, like a psychological block that Sanji experiences there. Um, think of it like, um, you know, with animals, because there's like like Pavlov and stuff would do testing and stuff. Like um, if you run an electrical current every time you try to drink or eat a certain kind of food, eventually your brain would get to the point where it's like associating that food or that drink with uh, pain. Because it's like every time like a, a rat in a maze tries to like, you know, take a wrong turn or tries to eat the wrong type of feed or, you know, cheese or whatever, they get an electrical shock or something and it's like, oh, okay. And so eventually they just steer clear of that cheese altogether. It's just like, screw that. I'm not going near that. Every time I go near that, I get hurt, you know? So it might have been something similar with Sanji where like Zeph beat him so bad. He's just like, yeah, you're not going to ever do this. And so Sanji can't bring himself to do it. Um, and he knows that's his weakness. He accepts that's his weakness. So that's why he asked for, like, Robin to help him during the last battle. He trusted in his friends to help him. And he knows he can't fight Black Maria, so he's going to go somewhere else and help out in another way, right? Now, I can understand you can find that uh, frustrating, find that annoying. You know, it's just kind of like, hey, Sanji, time to put things aside and fight. But it, it really is like a psychological, like, subconscious thing that he really can't... I mean, he might be able to get over it at some point, but I also don't think he wants wants to get over it so that's another thing too so there, there's situations you can involve there with like psychology and stuff i don't know um but i don't think it's confusing i think it makes sense given the explanation that oda gave Number two, where is the line drawn between Luffy's genius and his idiocy? Okay, so this is like basically like, Luffy's pretty dumb, right? Like, he's pretty dumb, like dumber than like the average person. Sometimes it's kind of like he acts like an alien on another planet kind of deal, right? Uh, that's the kind of situation there with Luffy. All I have to say about this one is you understand Luffy did grow up in the woods for pretty much his entire life, right? 
like, yeah, Dadon raised him, Garp raised him a little bit, but they weren't around for very long. Like, I think probably in his younger years, Garp was maybe the one that taught Luffy how to read and write. Um, but when it comes to everything else, like, Garp was chucking him in, like, the woods. Like, hey, Luffy, survive in this jungle for a week. Like, Luffy was, like, four or five years old at the time. You know what I mean? And then after that, he was raised by Dadan. And Dadan didn't really do much there, you know. Um, you know, they, they gave him a place to sleep. The Mountain Bandits did. Like, oh, you can come over here and have a safe place to rest or whatever. Uh, but for the most part, Luffy was living with Ace and Sabo out in the woods. And they weren't really, you know, much about, like, book learning and everything. They were mostly about training you know, getting stronger and, you know, wanting to get out to sea someday. And it's that like that. Um, and because of that, Luffy's really good at thinking on his feet. You know, he has genius in that concept of like fighting on his feet and like figuring out ways to fight an opponent at the last minute and coming up with new ideas and new inventive ways to use his powers, his gumu gumu no me and his hockey. Um, that's Luffy's like expertise, you know, but no, does he have any book smarts? Absolutely not. The way he was raised, he just wasn't. Maybe Makino tried to teach him a few things. Um, and he knows basic stuff, but like beyond that, he was mostly raised, you know, in the woods. That's essentially how it went. So that's all I really have to say about Luffy. Also, it's kind of a typical thing in a lot of anime. You know, the main characters kind of be like, not not so stupid, but like, you know, kind of um, bumbling a little bit. Not I mean, not bumbling is the right word, but kind of like um, oblivious to a lot of stuff. And that's that's certainly Luffy. And the number one most confusing thing about the Straw Hat Pirates, according to CBR.com, is... Chopper's human human fruit is perplexing. All right, so this one, I, I see the angle they're taking with this. Basically, the angle is Chopper is way too smart, um, where it's like, okay, he ate the human human fruit, which is supposed to give him the abilities of a human, so like human intelligence, so he can like talk and read and everything like that, stuff a reindeer can't do. But the intelligence is like insane. It's like mega mind kind of stuff, where Chopper is the youngest straw hat. He was 15 when he joined the crew, and he was already a master doctor, like one of the best doctors in the world, formulating, you know, making chemistry, making the rumble balls, and he's 17 currently, and he has more crazy things that he's learned from the Torino kingdom and everything like that. And the premise of this article is like, you know, he's only 17 years old how many 17 year olds in the world are that levels of like genius i would ask have you ever watched doogie hauser md but whatever um but no seriously that's actually not a bad point it's like there are geniuses that are like teenagers like it can happen right you know every now and then somebody could be born that's just like like a freaking master of a particular field of like engineering or physics or chemistry or medical science or whatever and you know by the time they graduate high school they're on the fast track to getting like a doctorate or whatever like it could happen right it's rare but it could happen right so that part is not super confusing there are geniuses that exist in our world um but i like to think that chopper's human human fruit like the whole point of the fruit is it gives the greatest aspect of humanity, which is our intelligence, like our higher our higher brain functionality, right? Because we, look, looking at human bodies, we do not have claws to fight. We don't have super sharp fangs. We do not have like a tough exterior hide like a rhinoceros or whatever. We can't fly. We can't breathe underwater like fish, you know? Uh, but what we do have is this. We have our noggins, we have our brains, okay? And that's how human society became human society, right? Um, back in Mesopotamia, uh, okay, I'm not gonna go into that, but, you know, I think that's what the fruit really embodies. It's like, okay, if you eat the human human fruit, you will achieve the highest level of intelligence. Like, you will become, like, a human, like, the highest level of a human intelligence, basically like that. So, you know, some of the, maybe the greatest geniuses on our planet, like, you eat the human, human fruit, and you get, like, Stephen Hawking level of, like, intelligence kind of deal. Like, Einstein level intelligence, all right? And that might seem kind of broken, that you can just eat a fruit and receive that kind of information. That, well, not information, because intelligence and wisdom are, like, different things. Uh, and even if you have the ability to understand it, you still have to study it. And Chopper still had to. Chopper had that level of intelligence, the capabilities, but he still had to study his ass off with Kareha and here look in order to really get to that point, right? It's just that because of his intelligence, because of his human brain and his qualities, everything that Kareha taught him, he was able to soak up like a sponge and he was able to understand it right away, right? That's just the way it is went with Chopper. Also, it might be something similar to like how... 
Uh, it's always said that if you're going to learn a second language, it's easier to learn a second language when you're like in elementary school. Unfortunately, when I was in elementary school, they didn't have the offer to like teach us like French or German or something like that. Um, I know in other parts of the world, like I think in Japan, I think like you can learn like foreign languages when you're like in elementary school. And that's actually really good because there's less stuff in your brain. So it's easier for you to pick up another language. And the older you get, the harder it is to learn another language or learn new stuff, right? Um, that's kind of where the term comes from. You can't teach an old dog new tricks or something like that. But that might have been the situation with Chopper where he spent pretty much his entire life as a reindeer, just a reindeer, you know, doesn't really know much about anything. And then he ate the human human fruit and then he met Hiraluk. And Hiraluk wasn't a great doctor, but he taught him about like, you know, probably how to read and write and all that kind of stuff. And then he met Kareha who really taught him good doctoring, uh, Chopper's doctoring. And then Chopper just soaked all that stuff up like like that and he was figuring out his own formulas and his own experiments and everything like that so i don't find that confusing i find that just like that is the power of the human human fruit like really really high level intelligence um it's like when you eat the wolf wolf fruit or the dog dog fruit model wolf that jabber ate he got the canine teeth he got the claws in order to fight as a wolf when you eat as a human, you don't really get, I mean, Chopper kind of becomes like a big kind of hulking dude, um, but he doesn't have a lot of stuff like other zones have to fight, so he got his intelligence in order to do that. So that's what humans do, and that's what humans have. Okay, so anyway, that was the CBR list. Uh, thanks for watching this video, everybody. Please comment down below on some other moments in One Piece that you are confused by, and who knows, maybe I'll do a sequel video to this, but until then, remember the definitions of active and passive, teching and Barry signing out. Oh, by the way, the, uh, the conclusion of the squirrel plot line yeah so i was right about to plan this whole like peace treaty between the squirrelians and we were gonna you know have this perfect society of squirrels and humans working together at last um but then they discovered foxes exist yeah foxes like you know not foxes pizza like foxes like the animal and the squirrels were like oh hell no and then they just left they kicked me out of their ship and okay bye we're not alone in the universe. There are squirrel aliens out there, but um, yeah. I mean, I thought, you know, you were squirrels. I thought they would have like, you know, laser guns or ways to like fight. But then do you really want to be on a planet when squirrels are fighting against foxes with laser guns? I think we avoided, you know, the worst of it there. So yeah, that's, um, that's the end of that little uh, story arc. Bye everybody.